Well, good morning. We are in Proverbs chapter 21, and I was thinking about the lesson in the number of Proverbs, uh, and I was probably overzealous. I picked out five or six, and I thought, no, I'm going to stick to four because I have never been on time in the new format. So this is my last time to teach in 2021, and I'm going to finish on time. So I'm bound and determined. Uh, so 21, beginning in verse 13, and these are four Proverbs that are very interesting because they have the same theme. They highlight the sovereignty of God and His all-wise providence over lives. Twenty thirteen. Twenty one thirteen. Twenty one thirteen. He, the one who stops his ear to the cry of the poor, indeed, he himself will also cry out and not be answered. Fourteen. 2114, a gift given in secret subdues anger, even a bribe in the bosom pacifies strong wrath. 15, 2115, the doing of justice brings joy to the righteous person but a terror to those who do iniquity. 2116, and our last proverb for the year. The man who strays from the way of being prudent will come to rest in the congregation. And the idea of this word congregation means the realm of it's a place that they cannot escape. They are locked in, if you will, the realm of the dead. Now, here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs. 2113 is another full circle of sowing and reaping. Another full circle of sowing and reaping. And 14, for the wicked, it is all self-serving. For the righteous, it is serving. For the wicked, it is all self-serving. For the righteous, it is serving. 15, the enjoyment of justice. The enjoyment of justice. And finally, 16, we only seek to be faithful. We only seek to be faithful. Now that's what I believe is the heart of the proverb, and this is the way I'm going to teach it. Uh, I look forward to being back with you in 2022. Mark has extended me a, another invitation to come back, and I'm very grateful to serve with him. Being in this class is, to me, a very high calling, and uh, I am greatly appreciative for your attentiveness and long-suffering uh, to put up with my work through the Proverbs. Here we are, 2113. Our exposition begins here. For whoever stops his ear to the cry of the poor, indeed, he himself will also cry out and not be answered. So you want to be wise. 
you want to have the skill for living, then here it is. Extend yourself to the poor. Be sensitive to their requests. The fool displays his lack in these descriptive terms. Look at them. Stops his ears. Cry. All directed to the poor. Insensitivity. Selfishness. Even cruelty. This word cry we've had before, Proverbs chapter 2, that's when wisdom, you remember, cried out in the square of the city, in the gate where people came in and out, shouting out. Here it's a call for help, seeking some form of deliverance. Urgency is this word cry in an emotional laden utterance. When the heart is hard, the ear is deaf. And we learn that by Nabal the fool, 1 Samuel 25. The request, a reasonable request from David was denied. That's the hard heart. And displayed in the few days later when he dies of a hard heart. Look at line two. See, it's life is not a random chance. Life is really guided by an all wise sovereign purpose. And here's the way, again, that it is identified in our reality that the behavior of the wicked person actually falls back upon the perpetrator. And how many times have we seen it? John Flavel wrote in his Mystery of Providence, he who does not look for a providence misses a providence every day. I was watching the other night this brand new series on World War II and now with the ability of computers and Modern day technology, they have taken black and white film and they have brought it to color. And it's fabulous, it's dynamic. And uh, you can really see things as they are. This version happened to be the Nazi invasion of Poland in the late 1930s. Uh, the Polish army, 300 men on horseback, a cavalry. Can you imagine the blitzkrieg of the Nazis facing 300 men on horseback? It was a slaughter instantly. And uh, of course, the Nazis wanted it all documented and carefully arranged the footage and the scene. Here's the horses stacked up, and here are the men stacked up. It's horrible. But there was one scene in this documentary that really caught my attention. They immediately went in and they rounded up all the Polish Jews that they could find, young men. And so this carefully placed camera is on a tripod and it shows the truck pulling up and all of these young Jewish boys immediately being hustled off the truck and down in front of the camera and run down into a long ditch. And then they were given the order and they were turned around and shot in the back of the head. And I begin to think, where did they find Hitler? Remember, he uh, committed suicide in his bunker, but under strict orders, his body was to be burned. And where did the Russians find his body? In a ditch. The all-wise providence of God comes full circle in life. Look at line two. He himself, 
This is the wicked's own cry for deliverance. At his time of need will not be answered. Now, my translation is indeed because our word here is emphatic. God is going to make sure of the consequences here. And notice that they're linked to the cause. You see that? We'll also cry out and not be helped. So that's the wicked. That's his way. It is what we've seen again and again and again. It is thinking that links to deeds that determine destiny. And there it is for the wicked. And here it is for the righteous. The Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Full circle. Fear God. And in the manner and the means by which you treat people, you will be treated. And that's the proverb. Here is 14. A gift given in secret subdues anger. Even a bribe in the bosom pacifies strong wrath. Now the wicked in the previous proverb resisted the cry of the poor. But notice here. Notice here they are capitulating to a bribe. They had no problem resisting the cry of the poor, but they themselves cannot resist a secret gift for themselves. This top line, the word gift, is self-seeking. And it's balanced in line two with justice perverting bribe. Our text says it comes in the form of secrecy, in secret. That's concealment. That's this, where you don't see it. Or this, where you don't notice. Very subtle. Our text says in secret. And look at the defined action in the bosom. That's underneath the clothes. Either to the briber or the bribed. We're never told. But the point is, it's in secret. And that's the hypocrisy that we have in the proverb. And the end result, the feature, it subdues anger. And that is matched in line two with its parallel, strong wrath. See that? Now, I actually read a guy that claims to be a conservative regarding this proverb. He may be a conservative, but he's no Calvinist. Here's what he said. It may be a matter of right place at the right time for a bribe. Perhaps if the motive is good and it doesn't pervert justice, a bribe should be considered the right thing to do. I could hardly believe what I was reading. Look, the Proverbs teach a spirit of collegiality. Reaching out to people, moving forward. The Proverbs teach gift giving. 1816. Proverbs 18, 16. A gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. But look at your proverb again. Look at it. Here is a gift in secret, which is self-serving, which means it's selfish. It is there with a, an agenda, with a motive. And the motive here is to quell anger. But you see, righteousness has no secret motives. Righteousness, it's all above board. 
It's all out in front. Righteousness is disadvantaging oneself to advantage others. I've set the Lord always before me, said David. That means all of his activities are lived out open before the eyes of the Lord. That's the way he went about his life. That was his way. That was his conduct. And was that not the attitude of the apostolic band as they would go to these cities, these ancient cities, and begin to set up and evangelize and build the church? Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonican Christians. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 He says, You know how we lived among you. It's, it's a matter of record. It's a matter of memory. It's a fact. It was all done and you got to see it. But here's the way that sentence ends. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 You know how we lived among you. And then the last three words. For your sake. You see, they disadvantaged themselves to advantage others. That's righteousness. The ministry is always open, out front, and the motive is the betterment of another person. Never a hidden agenda. It is always giving out. Never concerned about taking in. That's the ministry. And that's the proverb. Here's 15. The doing of justice brings joy to the righteous person. But a terror, your King James reads destruction to those who do iniquity. So after the two ways of the fool, verse 13, selfishness in regards to the poor, and verse 14, being pacified by a bribe for himself, in verse 15 here, we actually have the activity of the righteous. They're thinking. Namely, enjoying justice, goodness, and that being done in the terror that's meted out for the mind of the wicked. The top line opens with this verb, doing justice, the first word. Doing, to make, to do, it's the initiation of action. And here, it's taking up justice. The word justice is a famous Old Testament word. Ruling, judgment, laws, rights, claims. And all for a purpose. The result, the end, is restoring peace. We saw it in Genesis 13 with the dispute that broke out between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. His whole motive, Abraham, the leader, was to bring about peace. Not his rights. Peace. And so we call it legally today a settlement. It brings the matter to a conclusion and it should bring all parties to a resolution of peace. Now look at this word joy. Brings joy. Here's a good word picture for you. It's used in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 6. Jonah 4, 6. Of a large leafy plant that gave shed, shade to the pouting prophet as he watched God's compassion turn to Nineveh. It made Jonah happy that he had this big plant that shaded his head. That's this word joy right here. 
In line two, terror. We've actually seen this word before. Proverbs 10, 29. 10, 29. Terror for those who practice iniquity. Terror means the loss of courage. It's constantly used of armies in the Old Testament that lose the will to fight and thus they drop their weapons and run. That's this word. Loss of courage. And notice it is for those who practice iniquity. You see, the Proverbs promise, Proverbs 22, 22, 8, the sower of iniquity shall reap trouble. Now, in a world that's corrupted by sin, the psalmist writes in Psalm 12 and verse 8, that the wicked, they strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Welcome to our America. Isn't that what we see? At every corner we see it, don't we, today? We're actually the oddballs because of righteousness. And we don't fit into their worldview at all. What is happening here in our society, in our culture, is there's just no fear of God in the eyes of people. But you and I, the righteous, the believer in Christ Jesus, we long for, we find pleasure in the thought of the arrogant, the wicked, suddenly being seized with terror. When the Lord shall in His invisible providence mete out His justice, here it is, in the earth. That's what we want to see. Because His desires, well, they become our desires. They transform our thinking. The things that we hold dear and we believe, we like to see them. We like to see them practiced in all of our society every day. And that's the proverb. Here's 16. The man who strays from the way of the prudent will come to rest in the congregation, meaning the realm of the dead. Now that's has some thinking we've got to do. Look, this the way, top line, we know that. We recognize that instantly. It's life's journey. It's the straight path, the way of wisdom, of skill for the righteous, for the believer in Christ Jesus. It is the perceptive will of God in the New Testament. It is... The Christian way. And we learn from the New Testament that it is empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why we don't ask you to walk an aisle at Believer's Chapel. We don't ask you to, to raise your hand. We don't ask you to sign a card. Because the work is in here, in the quietness of your heart, where nobody sees. And that's regeneration. And you're changed instantly in a matter of moments. I remember I embraced Christ Jesus as my Savior. I immediately went in and got down on my knees. Never done that before in my life really saw my need. I saw my guilt and my sin ever before me. And then the next morning, I was off working at Trumbull Asphalt Company in the summer, up at 4.30. And the first thing I did 
I rolled out of bed and I got to, on my knees. I've never done that a day in my life. That's what John Calvin taught us. It's the regenerating work of the Spirit. That's silent, it's invisible, but it is powerful. And you see it in the lives, the trail that it leaves for people. It is a mighty ocean-going vessel that leaves a gigantic wake in its path. It is, in fact, Old Testament righteousness, the code, the law. But it's not the ceremonies. It's not the external. No, it is the law within your heart. And you are now practicing it. The Christian life is the life of Christ reproduced in the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Every one of those elements are essential for the Christian life. Now here is the alternative in the proverb. The crooked, the twisted path of the natural man that does not hear the revelation of God. He doesn't know the wisdom of God. Matter of fact, we're told in Proverbs 1.7, 1.7, that it is foolishness to him. Thus, he never embarks into the light. He stays in the darkness. His deeds are evil, says John the Apostle. And thus, the proverb says, he takes a way, he takes a path. It's defined definitively. It is the way of death, the way of utter ruin, in judgment. Now, here is line one. If this word man, it is the common word for man. Ground, dirt. God created the common man from the dirt of the ground. That's this word. So it's generic. It falls upon all men everywhere, in every time, every season, and every place. And look at his activity. He strays. Now this is a wonderful word picture for you. Isaiah 28, 7. Isaiah 28, 7. It is used of the staggering drunk. Here he is. And here he is. And here he is. See, he's never on the straight path. That's this man. He is moving in every direction. Proverbs 10, 17. Here's the way we translated this verb. 10, 17. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path of life, but he who ignores reproof, and here's our word, goes astray. That's what he does. He's all over the place. And as you read the book of Proverbs, so what you find is that the, the way of the fool, he leaves the path. He diverts. You have to watch the subtleties in the way it's described. In Proverbs chapter 7, it is the young, naive man, and he turns aside to the adulteress. Instead of staying on the way, you look for those things. It's very careful in the way it's described. But here's our word, familiar word, prudent. Prudent, wise behavior, good sense, the ability to give, understand the threatening situation. And more than that, it is to act decisively to prevent death or failure. See it often in the Old Testament. I have an insurance man in Oklahoma City, and he was at a health club, and he had just finished running 
And that's the last thing he remembered. He dropped to his knees and he fell on his face. And in the providence of God, this unbelieving insurance man of mine was six feet away, a doctor. This doctor was a, pretty much a research scientist in fetal care, but he's a doctor. And he sees what had just taken place, and he immediately rolls him over, begins to pound on his chest, and revives him, and stays with him all the way to the emergency room. I know the doctor, Jewish, brilliant, actually fought in the Israeli army, and came to America after his stint in the military, penniless. But he took tests, and he enrolled in medical school, and he set the curve. Amazing man. And he has amazing children as well. And that's this word, prudent. That's what he did. He acted prudently in a matter of moments. It is Abigail before David. Good sense is the way this word is translated. Prudence. 1 Samuel 25, there was Abigail stifling David's anger. It is David, 1 Samuel 18, diminishing the forces of the Philistines. He, with skill, knew how to do it. Prudence. Prudence, wise behavior, good sense. Now look, line two. Look at this. Don't miss it. You see, you've got to think theologically when you read the Proverbs. It's all about the sovereignty of God and His all-wise providence over your life and mine. Look, will come. That makes it a future certainty. This is what's going to happen. And this fool is going to rest. Now, that's an interesting word, and I've got a good word picture for you here. The word means to settle down. It means to remain. We have rest land here in Dallas. That's a good use of the word. It's actually found in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4. And here's your word picture. Genesis 8, 4. It's used for birds resting in the ark in the 40 days of storms. That's the word. And... The fool, he thinks he's in control going through life, going from place to place. But we learn quickly, don't we? When you're a believer, you learn. You're in control of nothing. Nothing. But he's got to be in control. It's the irony to life. He's so trying to control things for himself. And life tricks you because you have no control. And that's the fool and that's his behavior. I've got this Jewish acquaintance. I call him an acquaintance. I've known him for eight or nine years now. And uh, for some reason he likes me. You know the Old Testament better than I do. Uh, I said, no, I just know who wrote it. That's some bait he hasn't bitten down on yet. But uh, he's Yale Law, and uh, he's got this far-flung enterprise. He's deep into his 70s. He's on blood thinner. He looks terrible. And uh, I was with him the other day. It doesn't matter what the subject is. Invariably, we get back to one theme, one idea. And that is his brilliant brother who died in his late 40s, who was head of Johns Hopkins Research. We always get there. And, uh, you know, Dan taught us the book of James. He who wins souls is wise. 
I'm not wise because I haven't figured this guy out yet. But that's what happens. And I finish this conversation with him, and it's exhausting. It's just exhausting. And I, uh, and I get in the car, and I said, Lord, you know, that's the one thing that you have saved me from. The power of Christ over my life. I don't have to be in control of anything. I just have to be faithful. That's it. It is required of a servant to be faithful. <laughs> control. And so the game of life fools the fool. Because he's never going to have control. And that is ultimately in the decisions that we make. We make them every day, don't we? Wisdom leads to sure and certain blessings for the wise. And that's where the tension is, isn't it? That's where the rub of life really comes in, doesn't it? Right there. Because we quickly learn God doesn't pay on the first, nor the 15th, nor the 30th. Matter of fact, our way, all of us, our ways are filled with dark valleys, deep crevices. And we think, how did I get here? I feel so lost. I feel so alone. That was Job. You know, he said, if I could just sit down with him, if I could just explain to him, if I could just talk to him face to face, man to man, then he would understand. That was Job. But somewhere along the way, he left us a map. And here it is. You know the way I take, and when you've tried me, I'll come forth as gold. Let me illustrate what I think Job was saying. You know, we have this fascinating character in the Bible, Joseph. The man with this remarkable gift. He has dreams and he can interpret dreams and the dreams are all the same in this regard. They're all about the future. His dreams are precise to the future. So early in his life, in his career, he has two dreams regarding his family. That he is going to be exalted above them all. And that includes his father, Jacob, who is a patriarch. Now how is that going to happen? That's what he dreamed. And then he's in Pharaoh's prison. And of course, there's the cupbearer. He has a dream and the baker has a dream. And Joseph interprets their dreams. And just as if he wrote tomorrow morning's newspaper, it turns out exactly that way. And then Joseph is in prison. And he stays in prison for two more years. And then Pharaoh dreams. And faster than a shave and a shower, he's standing before Pharaoh, the monarch of all of Egypt, the power of Egypt. And he, he says to Joseph, I understand that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph says, well, here's what I would have said. If it had been me, I would have said, dreams, not a chance. Dreams, dreams have brought me the hatred of my family. They have separated me from my family and brought me down into Egypt. And dreams have left me in your crummy old prison. 
So just ship me back. I'm done with dreams. Dreams aren't a blessing. Dreams have been a curse to me all of my life. But see, he's mature, and I'm not. And what does Joseph say? He says, don't all interpretations come from God? Tell me your dream. And you know the rest of the story. He's elevated. He's exalted. He's prospered. Teaching us what? Teaching us what? That all your tears, all your heartbreak, all your losses, all of those experiences that you are going through or have gone through already have been stitched with a steel thread by a sovereign God into your soul. Now it is you. It's what you are. And it makes you very attractive. Compelling, really. And powerful. I'm with Christians on occasion, and I say, God, there's such a gulf between that person and myself. I read Elizabeth Elliot, and I think, you know, I even wonder if I'm even a Christian. Same with George Whitfield and others. Um, and then I've got these guys on Friday morning, all these young, testosterone heavy young businessmen. And uh, they are so smart. They're so gifted. They're so talented. And they're Christians. And I think, they're going to change the world. Look at these guys. But there's one thing that's missing. The it factor. And I always come back to it. You see... They just haven't cried enough. No, my friends, all of your tragedies have made you who you are. It's in the way. And for those young men, it will be in their way because God will see to it. To make you full, well-rounded, mature, Able for every good work. That's what He does. And that is your way. And that's what He's taking you to. You don't have to control anything. And you don't have to figure it out. Just walk it. The way. So I leave my study in Proverbs with a quote. From Solomon, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Your, your high IQ and your education do you no good here. Trust the Lord. Believe Him. Walk with Him. Fellowship with Him. And your way is going to be straight. And it's going to be good. And the blessings will come because He promises to give them to you. That's what He does. That's wisdom. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for uh, our time of study throughout this year in the book of Proverbs. So grateful for Believer's Chapel and for the teaching ministry of the Word here, and for the gifted people that you bring to us. Thank you for Mark and for his leadership over this class. And thank you for 
the ears that you have given us to hear and embrace what we know to be the truth, the wisdom of God, which is, Paul said, Christ Jesus in us forever. In his name we pray, amen.